Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Wong and I'm the manager of the US Academy team for Heidelberg Engineering. On behalf of the Heidelberg Engineering Academy, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Imaging Uveitis, the Bigger Picture on Inflammation. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the questions pane and they will be addressed at the end of a case, at the conclusion of the presentation, or in a follow-up email. Today's presenter, Dr. Ashvini Reddy, is a uveitis and retinal specialist at Athena Eye Institute in San Antonio, Texas. She completed medical school and residency at Baylor College of Medicine and fellowship at Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. Dr. Reddy was on the faculty at the University of Virginia and Wilmer Eye Institute before returning to Texas. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ashvini Reddy. Thank you so much. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I know that it is uh, just now starting and uh, there probably are a few people who are logging in right now. So um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And I am so pleased to um, show you guys um, how imaging can really transform your diagnosis and management um, uh, in for patients who have uveitis. So thank you so much for attending. We'll go ahead and bring up this first slide here. Here we go. Uh, first, I'll just begin with disclosures. Um, I have uh, worked with the following three companies and um, we'll start with our first case. Um, this is a case of a 36 year old woman uh, who was referred to my practice with a six month history of bilateral iridocyclitis. Um, the iridocyclitis had been unresponsive to topical steroids. Um, she'd been on drops as frequently as every hour, um, had been tapered down to twice a day or once a day and still had um, inflammation return. Um, her medical history was very good. She otherwise had extremely good health, had no recent illnesses. Um, at the time that I saw her, she was taking artificial tears as needed. Um, and she was also taking Predforte 1%, one drop four times a day in both eyes. Best corrective vision was 2030 in the right eye and 2025 in the left eye. She had no eyelid lesions and no skin changes um, on her exam. Pupils were five millimeters and reactive without an APT. She had normal motility and was orthotropic. Um, visual fields were normal and uh, intraocular pressure was normal. The anterior segment showed some rare AC cell in both eyes and some mild anterior vitritis in both eyes. She did not have any posterior synechiae um, and she did not have any PAS. And so these are fundus photo montages um, of both eyes. And you can see that, you know, the retina looks fairly good here. Um, there aren't any major um, areas of patchy retinitis. There are no vitreous um, uh, opacities that are large or um, any evidence of snowballs or anything like that. Um, and uh, the vessels themselves look pretty good. Um, there are no telltale signs of macular edema um, on exam. And her OCT was done. Looks pretty good. Um, no macular edema here um, that we didn't detect with our um, clinical exam uh, or our fundus photos. Um, everything looks pretty good here. So not a lot of um, extremely big clues. Um, because I suspected um, a more involved process, um, we also did a fluorescein angiogram. And this fluorescein angiogram is notable for a few things. Um, one, it looks like there is some hyperfluorescence around the disc. Um, these are late images. And you can see that along the major vessels, there are also areas of hyperfluorescence, um, which you can see sometimes um, in uh, certain forms of uveitis. Sometimes you'll see perifulvitis, um, and uh, venous involvement in conditions like sarcoid. Um, this patient's presentation looks fairly symmetric in both eyes, um, and the way that the discs appeared uh, made me think that she might actually have uh, another condition. And so the differential at, at this point um, was somewhat broad, and to help um, me decide what it was that um, she might have, I went ahead and ordered, um, let's see if it'll come up here, an ICG, whoops, let's go back. Um, and the ICG shows multiple areas of hypocyanescence that you wouldn't necessarily predict looking at her angiogram. Um, and this pattern um, is pretty specific, uh, not for sarcoid, which is what we most often associate with, um, uh, you know, hypofluorescence along the major vessels, um, but uh, with birdshot chorioretinitis. 
Um, and so looking at the ICG, that was my uh, uh, the highest uh, disease on my differential diagnosis. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about birdshot chorioretinopathy um, because it is something that is very, very difficult to detect sometimes in its early stages. Um, and ICG is very helpful at arriving at the diagnosis. Um, before this webinar, there were actually some questions submitted to um, uh, to us for consideration, and one of them was um, on better imaging the choroid, and so ICG can play a critical role there. Um, and birdshot is sort of the, the classic case um, that differentiates, um, or that, that allows us to really um, visualize the choroid um, you know, extremely well with ICG and really lends a lot of information um, when it comes to patient management. Um, birdshot chorioretinopathy is a rare bilateral chronic posterior uveitis um, that's largely de defined by international consensus criteria. Nobody knows exactly what causes the disease, but there is an HLA association with it, and that is usually used to make the diagnosis um, in patients who have a suggestive clinical um, presentation. Um, the cardinal criteria for diagnosis is the presence of typical birdshot lesions, which I'll go back here and kind of show you again um, this patient's ICG. You can see those lesions are scattered around. Um, they tend to be more um, uh, uh, greater in number sort of nasal to the nerve um, and more prominent nasal to the nerve as well, um, but they can be scattered all throughout um, the choroid. Um, they're usually, when they're seen clinically, cream colored um, and they can have irregular indistinct choroidal um, uh, spots uh, and they tend to be sort of clustered around the optic disc and radiate out from the disc with um, some relative sparing within the macula. Um, and this is another case of a patient, um, patient who had birdshot chorioretinopathy um, with lesions really only detectable on ICG. Um, in the first two pictures at the top, um, you can see the patient's fundus photo looks fairly benign. Um, maybe there's a little bit of, um, you know, mild discoloration or uh, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, prominence um, around the disc, but nothing major. Um, the angiogram shows those same areas along the vessels that appear to be hypofluorescent in late stages, um, but not much hypo hypofluorescence um, suggestive of choroidal lesions, whereas the ICG down at the bottom really shows hypocyanescent spots um, fairly well um, around the nerve and then also sort of extending into the macula. Um, and so very, very helpful to diagnose these cases. There was, in 2015, um, several of us collaborated to publish some um, uh, series of uh, patients who had birdshot chorioretinopathy um, that had lesions that were only detectable by ICG. Um, and so this is something that we see fairly commonly in a uveitis practice. The patient might be referred for low-grade um, anterior vitritis or iridocyclitis um, without much really um, evident in the retina, uh, but the imaging, again, can really kind of highlight that there is something going on. Um, and it is valuable to maintain a high index of suspicion of birdshot in patients who have um, disc edema and vitritis. Um, even when the fundus exam and angiography, um, uh, classically done only with fluorescein, don't suggest choroidal involvement. And so HLA typing is usually used in these cases to sort of um, cinch the diagnosis. Um, birdshot chorioretinopathy is strongly associated with the HLA A29 gene, but there isn't an absolute requirement um, that it be positive for diagnosis, as there have been some cases reported in the literature of patients who are HLA negative. That being said, most of us um, in uveitis um, you know, find the HLA typing to be very valuable um, because um, this particular HLA has the highest relative odds um, of, uh, you know, all conditions of being associated with birdshot chorioretinopathy. Um, we don't recommend routine HLA testing in all patients who have, um, you know, uveitis because the positive predictive value falls when it's applied indiscriminately. And so this is another um, case of a patient um, with a fluorescein angiogram. Um, you can see that the uh, there are those areas of hyperfluorescence um, around the nerve and then um, some hyperfluorescence along those major vessels. Um, and so um, fluorescein can show some prolonged transit times. Um, there have been some uh, cases uh, that report that, but that's not necessarily pathognomic. Um, whereas the ICG um, tends to be very valuable, as you can see in the image uh, to your right here down at the bottom. Um, 
ICG has been shown um, to be a much more sensitive measure of choroidal activity, and it allows us to detect the disease earlier. Um, this really benefits the patient by reducing the need for expensive testing um, and uh, you know, preventing a lot of anxiety and delay to diagnosis. This also allows us to expedite um, appropriate interventions. Um, as many of you know, most patients who are diagnosed with birdshot um, ultimately end up requiring immunosuppression or um, aggressive therapy with local steroids um, to maintain their best vision over a very long period of time. This is a chronic condition, so oftentimes, um, you know, when these patients make a commitment to treatment, um, they are committing for many, many years, and starting treatment sooner um, can have definite benefit um, for these patients in the long term. Any questions about ICG angiography or the, um, the, the diagnosis of bird shot? Yeah, Dr. Reddy, actually, I, I have a question. Um, so uh, looking at the, the cases that you did the first the first case, um, it looked like you used the ultra wide field lens for the ICG. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like you're doing a lot of peripheral sweeps. Um, is it, do you find it really uh, important and to, to do um, peripheral imaging, wide field imaging? Is, is that your I preference think. in a birdshot case? Yeah, yeah. Um, I find that it's really helpful. Um, if you've got a 30 degree um, view, um, there is a lot of retina and cord that you are not going to be able to image. Um, and um, as we talked about, a lot of these lesions tend to be uh, radially oriented around the optic disc. And so if you're focused on the nerve and the macula, um, in this particular case, the one that I've got pulled up on the screen, you might not see those lesions as easily. Um, and so wide field is very, very helpful here. Um, uh, you can try to um, you know, sort of sweep out, um, and you can get good images that way, but wide field just makes it so much easier. Um, it makes it easier for me to show patients, you know, what spots it is that we're watching for. It allows me to um, have better comparisons moving forward. So if we see more spots five years down the line, 10 years down the line, I can pull up their um, prior angiograms and show them, you know, uh, something for comparison. And this really allows us to, um, to track and manage disease a little bit better. And do you, do you find that um, as far as the, the floor angiography, you're looking for uh, some diffuse leakage? Um, is, is the wide field, ultra wide field as important or do you, do you tend to lean towards a, a, a smaller angle of view for, for the floor angiography? Um, I really like the, the wide field. Um, I think most um, people who are managing, I just wanted to pull up something that would kind of give you um, uh, that view here. Whoops, let's see if we can go back and find it. Um, but when you are looking at a fluorescein angiogram, um, the wide field really allows you to compare, um, you know, uh, discrete parts of the retina over time longitudinally um, much better than, um, you know, uh, you would be able to otherwise. Um, diffuse vascular leakage um, is something that we see um, from many forms of posterior uveitis, but especially when it's um, sort of focused around those large vessels um, when those are the more prominent areas of vascular um, hyperfluorescence, um, that really can be uh, an important clue. Okay. We've actually just got a question from the audience. Um, oh. So do you find uh, FAF to be very uh, helpful in the diagnosis of Berkshot? Um, I don't rely as much on um, fluoresc uh, fundus autofluorescence as much. Um, I tend to use ICG. Um, I just find that its sensitivity is greater. Um, I think that in my patients who have more advanced birdshot, um, you know, uh, autofluorescence, and I'll show you some cases a little bit later on um, where I feel like autofluorescence is um, a little bit more valuable, but in my practice, I find ICGA to be, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a much more sensitive test for these patients. Great, thank you. Thank you. Let me go forward just a little bit. This is um, another case. Uh, this is a 37-year-old male who was referred for bilateral vision loss. Um, he was referred to the clinic with a diagnosis of optic neuritis. Um, it was an insidious onset per patient. Um, because he had this history of optic neuritis, he had an MRI done by the referring provider um, that was reported to be normal. The patient had denied any history of any unusual exposures. Um, in terms of his medications, he wasn't taking any drops, and he wasn't on any form of systemic medication, including immunosuppression. 
Um, best corrected vision is pretty poor in both eyes, 2400 OU, no eyelid lesions, no skin changes, no APD. Uh, motility is full, his pressures are pretty good at 12 in both eyes. Um, on anterior segment examination, he doesn't have any keratitis or scleritis and no anterior chamber inflammation in either eye. This is a picture of the fundus in both eyes. Um, and what you can see here are um, some areas of discoloration within the macula where there are some pale areas that look like um, they suggest th uh, that suggest that there might be some areas of um, retinitis or retinal involvement. Um, the nerve itself actually looks fairly good to me um, for a patient with optic neuritis. And so um, it looks fairly pink, not completely pale, um, but the retina really suggests that there might be something else going on. Um, and so let's see if this will advance here. Um, this is also a fundus multicolor image. Um, oops, let's go back. Um, that also shows um, that area in the retina. And you can see that that actually um, allows us to see that border pretty well. Um, the, uh, the fovea itself looks like it's got some modeling and discoloration, which is easier to pick up on the multi uh, multicolor photo than it was on the fundus photograph. Um, OCT. Um, this patient has a lot of outer retinal changes and outer retinal atrophy with lots of um, loss of outer retinal landmarks and distortion of the ISOS. Um, you know, then uh, uh, that kind of leads us away from the diagnosis of optic neuritis um, alone, right? Um, and he's also got some posterior vitreous opacities, which you can see just hovering over the, the fovea in both eyes. Um, this patient, um, we suspected of having, uh, um, you know, a more, um, a much more serious condition um, than isolated optic neuritis. And so um, we ordered as part of his workup a test for syphilis. His RPR was positive uh, at 1 to 256. Um, he got IV penicillin and he actually did really well. Um, these are images of his from one month later. Um, his OCT looks amazing, right? Um, compared to what it looked like a month prior, um, the ISOS has um, started to come back. He's got nearly full resolution of his outer retinal changes and those um, pre-retinal opacities that we saw, um, those have completely cleared. And these are fundus photographs of both eyes. Um, those areas of um, uh, retinal change that we saw within the macula are um, completely gone. And his final visual acuity is 20-25 in both eyes. Um, and so this is um, a really, really nice case, I think, that sort of shows you um, how um, even if a patient's referred for one specific type of problem, um, when you're seeing somebody who has um, an inflammatory eye disease, it might really um, you know, involve much more of the eye and especially the retina um, than you think. And so I thought this was a really nice case because um, syphilis is, um, you know, within the differential diagnosis on virtually all of my patients um, that I see. And it is something that is really important to diagnose, one, because it doesn't get better and can actually get worse with immunosuppression and um, oral steroids. And two, patients do really well. Almost all the patients I see who come in and have a diagnosis of syphilis um, do very well once they're started on IV penicillin. And so this is one of the things that we can give patients uh, that make them 100% better. And their risk of having reactivation is extremely low as long as they don't re, uh, reacquire the disease. Um, any questions about this case? Yes. Um, so you you used utilized uh, multicolor for this this patient. Um, is that is that a standard for you for your patients? Um, inflammation patients is uh, a multicolor in addition to a, a color fundus image. Um, it can be. Um, sometimes I see. Um, uh, areas that border disease a little bit more clearly um, on a multicolor image. Um, and in this slide, I didn't break it down into the different um, uh, uh, the different, um, you know, red free and, and um, other filters. But you can see here um, that you can actually kind of see the fovea a little bit better and get a sense of the distortion that might be there than you can in the fundus photos. Um, and so I think that it has its place um, as a complement to my standard fundus photos. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Um, there is one. Oh, it was actually a comment. So the, uh, the multicolor picked out the, the placoid uh, lesion nicely. So. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And so um, I really do think that it's got its place. Um, there's just so much um, value to getting imaging in these patients. Again, because a patient who comes in and is referred to you for one form of intraocular inflammation might actually turn out to have something else. Um, you know, I've had patients who were referred to me for anterior uveitis, um, and sometimes I'll still get an OCT on them. One, because um, I like to establish a baseline. Um, a lot of times these patients will go on to develop macular edema um, or um, develop 
some sort of retinopathy um, uh, in you know as a, as a consequence of their condition. Um, two is sometimes the imaging will actually pick up something subtle that someone hadn't noticed before or wasn't able to notice before without imaging. For example, in this OCT, um, those vitreous opacities tell me there's probably something else going on, um, and the retina itself is very telling. Now, those outer retinal changes we see, um, you know, with uh, with syphilis, um, oftentimes, so it kind of points us in the right direction. Um, it allows me to have um, an interesting conversation with the patient about what we're following and what we're monitoring. Monitoring, um, and it allows the patient to be able to visualize um, themselves improving. So, for example, you know, when the patient comes back in, and I can show him his retina from uh, when he first came in to one month prior after having just completed two weeks of penicillin, um, the patient can feel really reassured. Um, and I think that it really just is is just such a nice compliment to um, a good you know um, outcome is to be able to show the patient how they got better and what their retina looks like now. Here we go. Um, this is the case of a 19-year-old female um, who comes into clinic because she's unable to tolerate bright light in the left eye. Um, she has blurred vision that she says has been worsening for two weeks. Um, the patient has a history of leukemia in remission following a bone marrow transplant. Um, she has a history um, of is herpes zoster anterior uveitis diagnosed three months prior in the left eye. At the time she's referred, um, she's taking acyclovir 400 milligrams twice a day, and she's on Pred Forte one drop four times a day in the left eye. Um, best corrected vision in this patient is 20-20 in the right eye and 20-30 in the left eye. She doesn't have any eyelid lesions. There aren't any skin changes um, uh, consistent with zoster um, involving the eyelid. Um, pupils are reactive in both eyes without an APD. She's got full motility. Um, pressures are reasonable inside both eyes, a little bit lower in the left eye, which is the eye that we're concerned about. Um, the anterior segment looks normal inside the right eye, and um, I've got pictures of the left eye here. Um, it's a little hard to tell, but she's got some mild cell about um, trace to one plus cell in that left eye, and there's a little bit of flare. There aren't any posterior synechiae, um, and the eye otherwise, aside from the cell and flare, looks pretty good. Um, these are color fundus photos of both eyes. Um, the right eye color fundus photo looks pretty good. Um, you can see into the macula, the nerve looks nice and pink. Um, the vessels look pretty uh, normal. The view into the left eye is pretty poor. Um, it looks like there is some vitreous haze or vitreous um, uh, inflammation that is um, keeping us from getting a better view, especially of the nerve. Um, the macula itself is pretty hard to see, but looks flat. Um, the vessels look um, good coming off of the disc, um, but they are a little hard to see. Um, and it looks like there are some blotchy red areas that are um, out of focus and uh, potentially obscured by the vitreous inflammation that we suspect in the left eye. This is the um, uh, first uh, image of the angiogram in the left eye. And you can see that the disc lights up quite a bit as we go. And we can uh, uh, take a look at a montage also, um, and that shows us um, that there is a lot of hemorrhage sort of scattered throughout the retina, um, and that the view to the entire retina is pretty poor. And when we montage the actual angiogram, um, this is very concerning, right? Um, what we see, the most marked finding, I think, um, are the peripheral area, uh, the areas of peripheral non-perfusion in that left eye. Um, there is um, quite a bit of leakage around the disc and leakage off of the vessels. Um, and there is blockage from the areas that we saw um, hemorrhage um, in the retina. Um, does anybody want to hazard a diagnosis as to what this is? It's a little hard on a webinar, I know, so I'll go ahead. Uh, but this is a patient who has acute retinal necrosis, or ARN. Um, and I think it's a really important diagnosis to go over um, whenever you're talking about imaging for uveitis. Um, because this patient, you know, had been on um, an antiviral and had been on topical steroid drops without a good view to the retina in the back for a long time um, and had been referred. Um, and, um, you know, without getting um, the best images that you can of the retina on the left side, um, you're going to have a hard time tracking this and um, uh, you're going to have a hard time, um, you know, making sure that this patient has a really good outcome. Um, and so um, this patient was treated with intravitreal antivirals and topical steroids and actually did fairly well. Um, she regained vision up to 20-25 in the left eye and never had any involvement on the right side. Um, so she did very, very well. Um, and I wanted to 
show you guys some images of autofluorescence and how you can use it in these cases. Patients who have acute retinal necrosis um, often have areas of necrotic retina that we're monitoring um, over a long period of time and that we are always watching to make sure it does not expand. Um, and especially in, when they're first starting to respond to antiviral, um, we want to make sure um, that those areas are not spreading as quickly and eventually quiet down. Autofluorescence allows us to do that. Um, and so this is a patient um, a separate patient who came in um, with our net presentation, and you can see his um, fundus photos there up in the top third of the image um, uh, montage or the image collection. Um, and then in the bottom third, you can see the patient um, at three months following presentation, um, and he's got this area of necrotic retina right here, um, which we were able to image using um, the wide field um, apparatus on the Heidelberg. And you can see that there's actually a nice little area that is um, well demarcated. Um, and you can see that there's a bright white line in um, advance of that, uh, or more posterior, and that the, the retina um, within that area is uh, black or, or basically dead um, and unlikely to change. Um, this patient was at higher risk for a retinal detachment and um, to try to protect him from that because this area looked so, um, you know, so poor, we did do a little bit of photocoagulation um, around um, the lesion and it looked like it stabilized and autofluorescence allowed us to image this patient's retina um, serially on every exam and he did really well. Um, and so I thought this was um, a really nice complement um, to uh, a clinical exam. And um, in many patients, doing an autofluorescence is going to spare you from having to, um, you know, perform something a little bit more invasive like an angiogram and other things. Um, we use autofluorescence quite a bit in uveitis, um, especially to image the white dot syndromes. Um, this is a... Um, image that was taken from a paper um, authored by CVA um, on autofluorescence imaging on, in the white dot syndromes. And you can see here that this is a patient with um, serpiginous choroidopathy. Um, image F um, shows a patient who has serpiginous, um, and there's a little area, there's a little focus of inflammation um, that the arrow is pointing to that lights up pretty well on autofluorescence, and then it's that area that's identified on angiography as well. And so autofluorescence can really tell you if there's a hot spot. Um, in, uh, in acute retinal necrosis, it can allow you to delineate the area um, that has been necrotic and uh, identify the border of that area really easily, um, which is nice. Um, in the white dot syndromes, oftentimes an autofluorescence is easier to do in clinic, less painful for patients to have to do, and can give you um, enough information to help you decide whether or not you want an angiogram that visit um, or whether you want to escalate the patient's therapy based on what you see. Um, so it is extremely valuable in my practice. Um, any questions about um, autofluorescence or acute retinal necrosis? Hey, Dr. Reddy, um, what, are there other diagnoses uh, related to UBIs that you find that autofluorescence is, is, is beneficial for besides the ones you've talked about already? Um, absolutely. Um, the Virtually all the white dots. I mean, um, I think that there is value in getting an autofluorescence um, in those patients. Um, a lot of my VKH patients, um, I'll get an autofluorescence on also. Um, it, um, I have uh, a number of VKH patients um, who have um, disease that advances, um, especially um, you know early on when they first have their diagnosis, um, and so sometimes autofluorescence will allow me to um, to image the patient and get kind of a high contrast view um, without putting the patient through an angiogram if they've had one recently. And so there's um, there's something really nice about being able to do that. It's just um, a really nice, clear image for those patients to, again, be able to, to even uh, look back on and compare where they were, um, you know, once they go a few months further down the line. And so we'll go ahead and go on to one more case here. Um, this is a 34-year-old male um, who was referred for anterior uveitis. Um, this patient reported that he'd been seen uh, by multiple specialists um, he'd had insidious, uh, insidious onset blurred vision in the left eye worse than the right. He has a personal history of um, being an immigrant, having um, moved to the United States from Hyderabad, India. He'd been on and off topical steroids for many months, and at the time that he was seen, um, he was on Predforte um, one drop four times a day in both eyes. 
best corrected vision is not bad, 20-25 in the right eye and 20-40 in the left eye. External examination doesn't show any eyelid lesions or skin changes, and the pupils are both reactive without an APD. Um, extraocular motility is full, and um, the patient has full visual fields with um, a slightly low pressure on the right eye of 8 and a pressure of 10 on the left. Anterior segment exam shows some rare cell in both eyes, and the interchamber is deep in both eyes. This is the patient's fluorescein angiogram, and there are many notable things here. Um, probably the most striking thing um, is that there are multiple um, lesions um, within the retina and probably, probably the choroid um, in this eye. Um, this patient also has pedaloid edema, it looks like, in the left eye, um, and so those are very concerning. Um, again, the patient had only had a history of anterior uveitis at the time of referral, there we go. Um, this is the patient's OCT. Um, the choroid in the eyes here doesn't look super thick. Um, there's no macular edema on the right side. Um, there are a few overlying vitreous opacities um, on the right side that you can see on OCT, um, but not many, nothing that looks terrible. Um, the left eye has definitely got some edema and a little bit of fluid um, right there underneath the fovea. And this is the patient's autofluorescence. Um, Chris, in the last scenario, you were asking about other conditions um, that I use autofluorescence in. And truly, I like it for almost everything because at worst, it just tells me that there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, and that's also kind of nice. Um, and I don't have to stick the patient to find that out. Um, it gives me um, a nice image that I can always fall back on because my uveitis patients are usually with me for life. Um, and so if sh something should develop, we can always look at their earlier photographs and say, well, that wasn't there before. Um, this patient's autofluorescence fluorescence image shows areas of scattered hypoautofluorescence in both eyes um, that are consistent um, with, uh, you know, scattered lesions. And I'm trying not to give away the patient's diagnosis here. Um, but um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is the autofluorescence also allows you to see um, this area of pedaloid edema. Um, and we don't um, you know, classically think of autofluorescence showing that very well, but it actually can. Um, and so in patients who have fluid in the retina, um, I mentioned VKH in the last case, um, sometimes the autofluorescence will allow me to, um, you know, uh, to image that in another way as well and to just kind of uh, make sure that I've got sort of this nice view of what the retina looks like. Um, what would you guys say is on the differential diagnosis for this case? So we have one guest, Dr. Reddy, and it's uh, tuberculosis was the guest. Oh, yeah. No, that's exactly right. Uh, this patient has a very classic presentation. Um, he's from an endemic part of the world. He's got scattered multifocal lesions um, throughout the posterior pole and within the retina. Um, this is a chronic condition, it sounds like. It's insidious since onset. It's been going on for a long time. Um, and TB can look like anything inside the eye. Um, but it uh, very often looks like this, um, especially when it's gone unchecked for a long period of time. So um, gold star to whoever offered that diagnosis. Um, the quantifier on gold was indeed positive, um, and that gives me the opportunity to talk about um, one of my favorite conditions, uh, tuberculous uveitis. Um, this is more common than we think, um, and unfortunately it's pretty protean. It can show up in almost any form. Um, uh, interferon gamma release assay is the preferred testing method for most of these patients. Um, a lot of patients will, uh, like many of us, um, have a PPD or something in the past, um, but you know, the quantifuron gold is really kind of a nice test for uh, a number of reasons. Um, one, it does not require the patient to return to have a skin test read um, a few days later. Um, two, um, it's just much easier to have the lab draw this test, and it's um, definitely a better test in patients who've been BCG vaccinated, um, which is, you know, the parts of the world where TB has been endemic for some time. Um, many of these patients are going to need chest imaging in addition to their quantifuron test. Uh, and uh, the management of this condition requires coordination of care with an infectious disease specialist and the Department of Health. Um, there was a recent publication um, called the Collaborative Ocular TB Study, or COTS, um, that went through um, kind of when we want to treat patients with which condition. Uh, or which types of manifestations of tuberculous uveitis. Um, 
And it really depends a lot on, you know, where the patient comes from, what their um, quantifuron gold test is, and whether or not they have signs of any type of uh, TB active or healed on their chest x-ray. Um, and because the manifestations of TB can vary, imaging can reveal almost any pattern. Um, and posterior uveitis and macular edema are sometimes really hard to detect without imaging. Um, and so imaging is just extremely valuable in these cases, because um, so many times I find some Thing that someone didn't suspect before or that has evolved recently um, and it just allows me to give patients perform some really guided um, lab testing um, and it allows the patients to kind of see how their condition is evolving um, and improves with the right therapy and so um, I encourage everybody attending to consider OCT and autofluorescence in any suspicious cases um, because it's light. It can't hurt the patient. They can't have an allergic reaction to it. Um, they, you know, nothing bad can happen when you uh, perform an OCT. <laughs> you know, I just find it to be a really valuable test. Um, same for autofluorescence. And so um, I wanted to um, give the audience a chance to answer, to ask some questions here. Um, what other questions do you have? Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy, for that fantastic presentation. Um, so. One of the questions that popped up uh, for this last case was T-spot versus quantifuron gold, pros and cons. I really, I think both of them are reasonable. I always order the quantifuron gold. It just works with my labs and um, it works with the location where I have my patients draw their labs. Um, and I haven't had any issues with it. Um, the T-spot is not, or has not always been available in, um, you know, every location that I've practiced, and so I have less experience with it. Um, I think you could order it and um, use that to make the diagnosis, certainly. Um, you're still going to have to get a chest x-ray, um, and so um, as long as the patient, you know, um, has a diagnosis, uh, um, and uh, by either one of those tests and is referred to the, the right authorities to start treatment for this condition, um, I think either one is fine. I believe this next question was referring to this last case, but I, I'm going to generalize because I think it's an important question to ask. Um, so in the cases where you can't do a fluorescein angiography or an ICG, um, do you usually have uh, some sort of modality or a, another type of test that you feel like um, can give you a a diagnosis, a confident diagnosis, um, when you don't have those tests available, um, and and what are the what are the tests that you kind of lean on a little bit more for for uh, uveitis patients? Yeah. Um, in general, I feel like if I had to choose one test um, for all of my patients with uveitis, and I could just go into you know I could go into this battleground with just one weapon, <laughs> I would probably choose an OCT um, because as good as my vision is, I can't do 3D reconstruction of the retina with my eyes. I just can't do it. Um, and I feel like um, OCT really allows me um, to visualize the part of the retina um, that is most involved um, most easily. So I can find inner retina regions and follow them. Um, I can, you know, with my with my aided eye, with my lens, I can definitely see that there's modeling of the retina sometimes. Um, but the OCT allows me to see exactly where it is um, and allows me to follow it really, really well. There is a patient that I started to see about three months ago um, who was actually referred to me um, uh, because the referring provider had been worried about um, laser-associated uh, retinal damage. Um, the patient had been playing with um, a laser at some point, um, and um, the referring provider was like, you know, I think he has some sort of laser-related retinopathy. Would you like to see him? And I was happy to, and I did. Um, and this patient, um, when I did an OCT and I looked at his retina, it looked much more um, like this patient's retina here um, than it did like anybody with laser retinopathy. Um, the patient did not have linear lesions anywhere, um, and he has just some subtle intraretinal cysts. Um, I you know, talked to the patient. He said that his eye disease had actually started long before he ever played with the laser, and I thought that was kind of unusual, and he didn't seem to be hiding any information. Um, and so after talking to him, even though he didn't have any risk factors, um, I ordered a TB test. Um, and this is a guy um, who had never left the United States, didn't have any risk factors for TB, other than his mom um, was in healthcare. Um, and his TB test came back positive. His chest X-ray was negative. And um, because he had bilateral involvement and had a pretty large PED in one eye that I could see best with OCT, 
um, I took that information to the Department of Health and I said, you know, would you guys be um, able to treat this patient for suspected TB um, given what we see, even though he wasn't a slam dunk diagnosis? Um, and we started therapy a few months ago. And the patient actually did really, really well with TB treatment. Um, his outer retinal lesions um, got much, much better. Um, his vision improved. Um, and I'm so happy that we went that route. And I wouldn't have suspected that condition um, without an OCT that looked fairly suggestive. Um, and how he got it, I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I just think an OCT is invaluable. Um, and autofluorescence, I can suspect what that'll look like. Um, and uh, angiogram, I can suspect what that'll look like in certain cases. Uh, but an OCT always gives me um, information that I would have a hard time detecting. With. Next question we have for you, Dr. Reddy, is um, what do you do for anterior, anterior scleritis patients? Um, and is there a way to rule out posterior scleritis in these patients? So anterior scleritis patients are, um, they are one of my favorite types of patients to see um, because um, so often um, they actually have an underlying diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis um, or another condition. Um, and so um, when they come in, um, my approach to them is actually to start with a good physical exam. And so I look very closely at their hands. I want to see if there's any elder deviation, any deformity to their joints um, that would suggest a specific rheumatologic diagnosis. Um, I then go ahead and order a workup. Um, I talked a little bit about infectious uveitis here, um, and I'll say that I usually do include a tuberculosis test and a syphilis test in these patients to be thorough. Um, but I'm usually looking very closely at the rheumatoid factor. Um, and if I need to, I'm also ordering a CCP. Um, I order additional labs based on what other um, risk factors the patient has um, and what might be um, common um, you know, uh, for a patient given their clinical history. Um, and so that really guides my workup. Um, for patients who have anterior scleritis with no posterior involvement um, and um, have sort of a classic presentation without any areas of you know, necrotic tissue or anything like that. My first line medication is usually an NSAID in the short term. Um, you can um, prescribe indomethacin um, or naproxen for these patients, and they tend to do pretty well. Um, the reason I tend to start off with an NSAID is because most patients can tolerate an NSAID, presuming they have good kidney function, they don't have a history of allergy, and the scleritis will usually get better. It might not completely go away with the NSAID, but it's nice to have. Um, and the reason I start with it is that toxicity is just greater with a steroid. And then if a patient does have um, an infectious disease like tuberculosis or syphilis, and somehow it's causing scleritis, and I don't know it right when I see the patient, I haven't put the patient at an increased risk by prescribing a steroid first, um, you know, on that first visit. Um, I usually order the labs and um, have the patient return to see me in about seven to 10 days when the labs are back or sooner if the scleritis looks like it's pretty bad um, and the patient really needs to be followed a lot more closely. Um, if the, the scleritis is getting better with the NSAID, um, I either continue the NSAID or try to reduce the dose a little bit so that the patient isn't overexposed. Um, for any patient that has a history of kidney function problems um, or another issue, we might be ordering labs to make sure that they're okay on the NSAID. Um, any patient who has a history of GI bleeding or ulcers, we're also talking to them about those um, uh, particular um, side effects that can occur with an NSAID and prescribing a proton pump inhibitor if needed. Um, if a patient's still inflamed on an NSAID, um, I'll usually switch them to prednisone um, to try to get their scleritis under better control. Um, and um, about 50% of the patients I see with anterior scleritis do turn out to have a condition um, that is uh, rheumatologic, especially rheumatoid arthritis. And so those patients, I'm usually working in conjunction with their rheumatologist to get them on something long term that'll help both their joints and their eye. Um, I think the second part of the question that you asked, Chris, was um, what you do for posterior scleritis and how you diagnose it. Um, Correct. Posterior scleritis um, does not have as strong an association with um, systemic disease as anterior scleritis does. Um, I still order labs for these patients to see what we can do um, to get them, uh, you know, uh, to evaluate them for a systemic association and to get them um, a better um, 
outcome if they do have one, um, but it's pretty rare that I find that there's a systemic association when patients have posterior disease. Um, for any patient that I suspect posterior uveitis in, um, I always get a B scan um, to see if there's a T sign or any subtle suggestion of fluid or thickening in the back wall of the eye. Uh, patients who have posterior scleritis uh, may have a completely quiet front part of the eye, um, and they look, um, you know, fairly good actually when they come in. They don't necessarily, you know, um, uh, have a have a you know bright red eye um, the way that we tend to picture scleritis in our clinic. Um, and so for them, a lot of times they feel like they're crazy because the eye looks okay, um, but they've actually got quite a bit um, going on in the back. Um, they can have subretinal fluid. They can have um, involvement adjacent to the nerve, and so you can suspect that based on a good dilated clinical exam as well. Um, for patients who have posterior scleritis, um, the medications I use uh, um, are similar to what I use for anterior scleritis, an NSAID, or um, a steroid like prednisone. Does that answer that question? Yes. Um, so we have time for one or two more questions. Um, so the next question I have for you, Dr. Reddy, is when the, the FA is done without a definitive result, um, what time delay do you do before, what time delay do you have before doing the ICG? Um, I usually administer both FA and ICG at the same time um, and uh, uh, take images um, uh, of the eye, you know, with them both running at the same time. So you're doing a, a, a simultaneous FA ICG? Yeah. Those are combined, yeah. Um, and this will be the time for one more. Um, so is there a particular layer loss with you lost with uveitis? Um, if so, do you use any layer thickness maps to see such a loss? With most forms of, you know, it depends on the type of uveitis. Um, so for example, if you've got, you know, birdshot and you've got a lot of macular edema, a lot of times, you know, the, the area around the fovea, um, that's the inner retina tends to be most distorted by the edema. And so it's not quite lost, but that's the area that's most likely to be affected on an OCT that's fo that's sort of, um, that's centered on the, the, um, the fovea. Um, and so um, that'll be, it's not lost, but it's it's kind of the focus of the repeated serial imaging. Um, for a lot of posterior uveitis, like white dot syndromes, a lot of VKH, um, the syphilis and TB cases that I showed today, you can have um, outer retinal changes. Um, and I don't necessarily always use um, a layer specific view um, to image that. I actually like to scroll through. Um, I use the posterior pole setting on the Heidelberg a lot. Um, and um, because of the tracking feature, it allows me to compare um, those scans over time. And I can see the ISOS growing in, um, which is always just one of my favorite things to do. Um, I'd like to be able to show patients these little pixels as they come together. Um, I have one patient who has VKH and has had it for over a year. It was very, very difficult difficult to control, um, ultimately ended up with uveitic glaucoma, needed tubes and uh, multiple surgeries, and is now a year later doing really well. And she's learned, she comes into my office and we look at the outer retina on her scans and she's now got a year's worth of scans and we just follow the little um, ISOS as it starts to grow in. Um, and so um, I think that that is really valuable. You can certainly look at the, um, you know, use a layer view. Um, but I, I just really like scrolling through with the posterior pole setting. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Reddy, for such a wonderful um, session. And thank you, everyone in the audience. Uh, we hope you found today's webinar thought-provoking and educational. If you'd like to be informed of any future webinars, please like us on Facebook or Instagram. Also, be sure to sign up on our for our business lounge at www.heidelbergengineering.com. By signing up, you'll receive access to free educational guides, videos, and e-learning modules. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you.